Hello friends, I'm Kayla. Today I'm going to be reading books and guessing their Goodreads average rating. As per usual, I love stealing ideas from other communities on YouTube and this showed up on my homepage and it said watching movie trailers and guessing their score. I don't know if other people have done this. I don't know if it's a trend, but here's where I originally got the idea from. And now I am going to read books. I feel like I could like read the synopsis and then guess because that would be more in line with what that was, the trailer, not the entire movie. But I just thought this would be a fun idea for a silly weekend vlog. And I just don't think it's fair to start on my TBR shelf because even though I haven't read these books, even though I haven't scoured their Goodreads, I feel like when I pick up a book, when I buy it, I have an idea of what the rating kind of is, what the general public's feelings about it is. So I'm gonna read three books in this video. And the first one, I'm gonna go to the library and I'm gonna pick something I have never heard of before and I'm gonna read that. So Goodreads ratings range, I mean, we're all rating books from zero to five, but generally books don't get lower than like a three and no higher than like a 4.5 on Goodreads. Actually, let me give you some examples. Sorry, the lighting in here is absolutely atrocious, but I'm gonna pull a book from my shelves I'm going to try to find ones that have over a million ratings. So a lot of people have read them. So you can get a general idea of like how the rating represents um, the general public's response. So a 4.7 is pretty unheard of, but Know My Name by Chanel Miller is one of those. A 4.6 would be Crooked Kingdom. A 4.5 is Project Hail Mary. The Hate You Give is a 4.4. The Fifth Season has a 4.3. Addie LaRue has a 4.2. Hey, that rhymes. A 4.1 would be Gone Girl. And Little Fires Everywhere has a solid four. I feel like this is gonna come in really handy when I try to gauge what the ratings are of books that I have just read that I know nothing about the general consensus for. Because if it's really good and I think people like it, I would probably give it above a four. These you can look at and say they are absolutely popular. The ones towards the bottom are ones that you're definitely in the minority if you didn't like, but there is a group of people that I'm sure you could identify that don't like these popular books. Representing a 3.9 is you, a 3.8 is normal people, a 3.7 would be some of Ruth Ware's earlier work, a 3.6 belongs to both Fifty Shades of Grey and Twilight, which I do not own, but I feel like those really sum up that rating. Some people love it, some people hate it. One of my favorite books has a 3.5, that's Bunny, but also one of my least favorite books, The Vegetarian, also has a 3.5. Wilder Girls has a 3.4, and The Cabinet the World has a 3.3. So you can definitely see how this stack is lowering in like general enjoyment. I would say the bottom ones here, it's the majority is just okay with it, doesn't like it. If you love these ones, you are the smaller group. And then some of the lowest ratings you'll see, a 3.2 belongs to the dinner, a 3.1 for leave the world behind, and a three on the dot belongs to things have gotten worse since we last spoke. Three of my favorite books. So we now have a visual representation and a chart that I think will help me figure out where the books that I'm reading belong. And like I said, the reason I'm not picking books that I already own is because I feel like I could have a general sense of this already. And I wanted to prove that to myself. So a couple nights ago, I filmed myself guessing some of the ratings of books on my TBR. And you can just see how that went. I don't even have some of these books on my Goodreads, so I don't know their rating. But I just feel like I easily get a sense of the vibes <laughs> that are out there, okay? I think like, if I were to pick some of the most highly rated things on my shelves, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, I think this is a 4.2. I think Lobazona is a 4.1. Wrong Place, Wrong Time is a solid four. Maybe it's because they were in the Goodreads Choice Awards. I've seen them around a lot. That's that's just what I think. Tomorrow, 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 4.2. Lobazona. 4.15. Oh my god, three for three, come on. 4.04. Thank you very much. And I haven't even read these books. Okay, now here's three that I think have a lower rating. So, um, Earth Eater, I think has a 3.7. Um, we Sold Our Souls, 3.6. And Camp Zero, 3.3. 3. <laughs> okay, what did I just say? Earth Eater. 3.6. We Sold Our Souls. 3.0, oh, 3.7. What did I say? I can't remember. Camp Zero. Did I say 3.3? 3.2. I feel like 
that's pretty close. So like I said, we're gonna be reading three books together. I don't know what they're gonna be. The first one I'm gonna go pick out of the library and then I'm going to guess the Goodreads average rating when I'm done. And here are the stakes. I want to get it within one decimal point. So if I guess that it's a four and it was actually a 3.9 or a 4.1, I win. And my prize is the next book that I read, I can pick off of my TBR shelf. If I get it wrong, I have to go back to the library or the bookstore and pick something that I've never heard of again. So we're going to go through this journey a couple times. First, I'm headed to the library and I'm going to see what synopsis is calling to me. So I ended up going into a little smaller branch rather than the huge Kelowna library so I could you know, hone in on things and not get overwhelmed by so many genres. They really only have like one sci-fi fantasy shelf and then there were some contenders in the mystery section. I read the synopsis of a few different books. I was kind of going based off of the cover. I wanted something maybe that was a little bit weird and what I found is this. It's called Security by Gina Wolfsdorf and it says it's crime but it's also just general fiction. Let me read you the synopsis and maybe we can guess the rating first off of the synopsis. Manderley Resort is a gleaming new 20-story hotel on the California coast. It's about to open its doors and the world, at least those who with the means to afford it, will be welcomed into a palace of opulence and unparalleled security. So we already have like a fun setting because it's just one location. Maybe we'll have a big cast of characters who are all working in the hotel. But someone has determined that Manderley will never open. The staff has no idea that their every move is being watched and over the next 12 hours they will be killed off one by one. It's a shocking thriller, a brilliant narrative puzzle, and a multifaceted love story unlike any other. It looks like this came out in 2016 and the fact that I've never heard of it is interesting. So if we're starting our whole ranking at like 3.5, that's a pretty average, like some people liked it, some people didn't. If you give it a 3.5 out of five, I feel like it's something that you liked but didn't really enjoy. So I'm already gonna skew a little bit lower because I've never heard of it. It's also only 229 pages. Sometimes shorter books get a little lower of a rating. It doesn't have a ton of blurbs from people that I have heard of before. So my prediction right now is it's gonna be 3.4, 3.5. I just dropped Liam off at a hockey camp, so I'm gonna read a little bit of this while he's getting ready. Once he's on the ice, um, I'll head in. But I just wanna give you my first impressions. something at total random that ends up being something that I love. I just read the first 24 pages. I'm stopping in the middle of a chapter to update you. This is chapter two because I already get the feeling this is not going to be for everybody, but I'm very, very intrigued. So it's definitely got that gothic style. And I've said so many times before, my favorite thing about gothic books set at manors and chateaus is the introduction and establishing the manor. And especially when somebody is traveling there and it's about the travel and it's getting there and first impressions and the overall vibe and the atmosphere. This just gave us so much about the place itself and the shape of it and the feeling that it evokes. And then we met a whole bunch of the people who work there already, like the electrician and housekeepers and like this manager person. And then we also got the killer. I was talking about all the people in the hotel and what they're planning. They're opening up, they're planning a party. And then it'll like look at the characters through a camera. It'll say, she appears via camera too. She's checking her watch, it's 5.58. Her body wilts, her feet slow, but her route is much more efficient than the other person. And then it'll also flip occasionally to the killer. It'll say, the killer is in room 717, sitting on the edge of a king size bed. That's not even the best part. The best part is sometimes it will give two different things happening at the same time. So the book will go, when the elevator, like middle of sentence stops and then continues. When the elevator disappears with Brian and Henry and Tessa inside, blah, 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 blah. And then you can go back and read when the elevator passes the second floor, Tessa sees Dolores wiping her eyes. And so it's like you're reading more than one thing at a time. And that's just my favorite thing. I like books that play 
with structure and format and I don't know that this is going to add anything else like I don't think we're getting documents or anything but I'm just thinking the Paul Bears Club and House of Leaves and all of the things that play with the narrative form that's something so fun and so it's kind of also giving me the vibes of uh, reading a book like The Final Girls or whatever that one's called by Stephen Graham Jones that is just uh, the like screenplay of a movie, like following the camera work, doing all of this stuff. I'm into it, but it's odd. I do see somebody dog-eared the page right at the end of chapter two, and I don't see any other markings, so they probably gave up at this point. I could see why. But I like it. That's so exciting. I am over the halfway point now. We are home, so I can pick a bookmark that fits the vibe. Maybe this one that has my username on it, and it's like a buckle. So the parts that I was talking about that are uniquely written, that is definitely getting more so and it's been expanded upon and I love it. And at some points you're reading at the same time uh, a sex scene and a murder scene in tandem. So we're just popping around the hotel seeing different things that are happening to different people. It is a slasher. Like it's a slasher. People are dying left and right. They are being taken out one by one. But also they're are just scenes in between that of people having very mundane conversations. Like nothing is happening. They're just talking about what they're doing on the weekend. The ones that make you think, why are we even reading this right now? Instead of the actual horrific thing that's going on. And it's reminding me because of that of leave the world behind. And then partially I would also say reprieve because like you expect it to be this escape room thriller but then you're just following these different random people and their daily activities. I think it's a little stupid. I think there is a mystery because the mystery is who the killer is or more so why. I guess the main question is why this is happening. Oh I forgot to mention the reason I was out so long and it's now sunset and I'm only this far in is because I only got to read a little bit because Liam got his braces on today so while I was sitting there and they were in his mouth doing all the stuff um, I just read a couple more chapters. He looks great. He chose um, light blue elastics. I think they look great. He doesn't seem to be in any pain, but he's very annoyed by things getting stuck in them and the list of things he's not allowed to eat. My kid's like a gum chewer. He's constantly chewing gum every second of every day. So the fact that he's not allowed to have gum like is a good thing because it's gonna kick the habit, but also I feel so bad. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna finish this right now. I'm finished with my book. I'm giving it, my initial instinct was like a four, but that feels a little bit too high. I feel like I've given out a lot of 3.75s this year, and this is just going to stick with that. I don't think it's a well-crafted puzzle that you might think it's going to be. It is a little bit stupid, but it was also really fun to read, and it was just silly and weird. The plot wasn't weird, but the writing was weird, and I stay committed to my comparison of these three because you're watching through um like cameras and then mundane activities and like it has thrilling elements but it's more about characters and their relationships but i loved all of these i gave them all five stars this didn't quite meet that i wouldn't put it on the same level i wouldn't recommend it to the same people it's definitely consistently action heavy but also like literally at the same time as the book is written it is super slow and drawn out and I liked it. I don't think the girlies did though. Like I don't, I don't think that this is a win. Um, and looking at the ratings of these three, I'm gonna stick security at, um, I think it is more tolerable for the general public, just a little bit though. I'm gonna say a 3.3. And I honestly don't know if I hope I'm right or not. I don't know if I wanna read something off my TBR or get to buy a new book, but we're about to find out. Security is not the first thing that pops up when you search the word security on Goodreads. Gina, 3.2, 3.28. Oh my gosh, I was so close. Wow, I feel so powerful. It has 3000 ratings, so a good amount of readers, including like seven of my friends. Okay, amazing. Um, tomorrow we'll get into what I'm gonna read. And also down here, I have a bunch of my fall decor. So I'm going to decorate a little bit tomorrow and I'll see you then. So my thoughts on today's pick is I do know general feelings about a lot of books on my shelves, but I think I could pull some that I don't even have on my Goodreads or I haven't really 
seen mentioned anywhere. We just need to find those. Um, so if we go through like everything on my shelf, the top shelf is priority TBR. So I want to pick something from up here. Now, I don't want to pick something that I know was in the Goodreads Choice Awards because then I feel like you know that it has a higher rating than like most other things. Not that that would give me the exact rating, but books can't even be suggested into the Goodreads Choice Awards unless they have over like a 3.6 or something like that average rating. So we already knock some things off just by that here, here, and here. And I also don't want to pick anything that was published this year because you know, before a book even comes out, people have left five star and one star ratings, and you don't really get a good idea of what the book is actually going to have as an average rating until it's been out for like six to 12 months. So that also knocks a couple off of here, a couple off of here, and a couple off of here. I feel like these two come to mind because they're published like kind of recently, but not super recently. I don't know if I even have them on my Goodreads. I don't think I know much about them, but they are really short novellas. I don't know if I want to read a really short novella. So what's speaking to me right now is the thriller mystery stack, but I also feel like mystery thrillers are always a 3.5 to a 3.7. Some of the lower ones probably secluded cabin sleep six and maybe 56 days just because I've heard not great things about those. Zero days has a high average rating because it just came out. Not that it's not great. I don't know. The ones that I really don't think I know anything about feeling wise is probably these ones because maybe they're more literary. Um, I don't know if that has led to them being lesser enjoyed or more enjoyed. Hold on. These two have award stickers on them. <laughs> Does that mean this book won or this author won? You know what though? Awards don't always mean that they have a high average rating. Sometimes books are given these awards and like the general public hates them. Ooh, also kind of matches my shirt. I'm gonna go with Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tokarczyk because this is my reward. Like even if I have a slight inkling that it has a higher average rating. I also feel like when I read the first chapter of this, it kind of started out with a similar style to Death in Her Hands, which has a really low average rating. And also it is a short one, which sometimes, like I said, leans to a lower average rating. So I do have some thoughts going into it, but based on the synopsis, let's see. In a remote Polish village, Janina devotes the dark winter days to studying astrology, translating the poetry of William Blake, and taking care of the summer homes of wealthy Warsaw residents. Her reputation as a crank and a recluse is only amplified by her not so secret preference for the company of animals over humans. Then a neighbor, Bigfoot, turns up dead. I read that in the first chapter. Soon other bodies are discovered in increasingly strange circumstances. As suspicion mounts, Janina inserts herself into the investigation, certain that she knows who done it. If only anyone would pay her mind. Okay, so that's synopsis. And if we get more answers and it's a clear narrative to follow, compared to Death in Her Hands, I'm just I'm still gonna start it out with like a 3.5. And as I read. I will give you reasons for why I'm bumping it up or bumping it down. I don't know what I was thinking wearing pink earlier, like we're transitioning into fall. Um, and then I just got this package from Old Navy. I ordered a couple things, this being one of them. I feel like it's fall, but not like too kitschy. I don't know. Here's the other stuff I got. I got this ribbed olive green shirt and then I got the same one in pink. I really like these. And then I got two um, cardigans to go with because I just bought this in tan and I went through all of my fall sweaters. They're getting holy. And I found this in like a tan from Old Navy a couple weeks ago. And so I decided to order online since I went in store and knew like what size I liked on me. I got like the burgundy and the black. So these are just gonna be some good staples and I can replace my older ones. And then I also got this green sweater. And that's that. I'm really excited about it. Now I need to go through all of my pumpkin stuff because I just buy a lot of pumpkin stuff and I feel like this is not fall. This is Halloween so we're not ready for her. I found this at Indigo recently and like this is the tag but I feel like I want to keep it on because it's cute and it smells so good. Liam picked one out that's from DW Home and this is one of the best smelling candles I've ever had in my life. It's just pumpkin cheesecake. Yeah. Then I brought out my good old fox that I always do, even though it's empty. 
I could fill this with my own candle if I wanted to put in the effort. Then I grabbed all the rest of my pumpkins out of storage. I feel like these will be cute somewhere. The ones that are shaped like pumpkins are always my favorite. I go a little too hard with pumpkins, hey? Then I also have all of my blankets and pillows that I'm gonna swap out on the couch right now. And I have some leafy things I'm gonna put on the TV stand. It's not the most exciting decor, but I do have a tiny house and I do what I can with it. Um, I got three chapters into this and there was one moment in chapter two i should have tabbed it basically what's happening in here is the guy who died she was concerned about his dog because he would like tie the dog up and not feed it and whatever and so she went over and took it upon herself to let the dog out and um she was going to the police and telling them to look into it she just says for the best conversations are with yourself at least there's no risk of misunderstanding. And I just feel like that's something that Vespa would really connect to. Because both of these are very internal monologue where there's a woman and she's accomplishing something, having a lot of thoughts. And I just like that perspective of her explaining like why solitude is so good for her. Anyway, let's get into the very brief uh, decorating montage. I could probably just put a clip in from last year because it's gonna look the exact same. I really struggled through this one and it makes me sad because I gave it a 10 out of 10 for initial intrigue. It's something I felt like I was excited to read. Um, maybe I thought it would be weirder. I don't know. Also don't know what my rating is really going to be or if I've explained perfectly what this is. So we've got Yanina, which I think is how you pronounce it. And there are all these deaths happening and she doesn't think that the police are taking it seriously or anything else. And every time she brings something up to them, they don't take her seriously because she's just this old woman and nobody respects her or her thoughts or her concerns. Um, her biggest concern is about animals. And like I told you about the dog that she was helping, she used to have dogs of her own she felt really close to. So she feels a lot of passion for animals and feels like the people in her village um, don't have the same respect and they're just willing to slaughter and kill anyone and anything as far as animals go. And now people are dying and she thinks that it's the animals getting their revenge. So while the things that I would compare it to are like, this is a literary dash book, like literary thriller, um, another literary thriller, literary thriller, literary horror. These are things that come to mind because they're more about characters and monologue over plot. My Sister the Serial Killer and Death in Her Hands and We Spread, um, a lot of them have the perspective of a woman being concerned about something. You're in her head a lot and sometimes it can feel like, especially with these two, like the ravings of a mad woman or that's how people interpret her. And those completely have a mix of ratings but they do lean low. But then because of like the, I would say beautiful language, here's the thing. I pulled out a couple different quotes that I enjoyed and I feel like we're saying something really beautiful, not just about animals, but mostly those parts um, that reminded me of something like Once They Were Wolves, where she, again, you're just in this woman's head a lot. And there is also a thrilling element to this. And she cares a lot about these wolves and it's talking about conservation and caring for animals. But then there was also stuff to say about um, creating a name for yourself and how the name you're given at birth it doesn't represent you and you should just get to pick whatever you call other people as you encounter them whatever feels appropriate there was that and then the conversation is just about getting older and nobody taking you seriously and um the way she cares about the creatures of the village the police will say like do you not have any like human beings to care about why are you focusing on these animals and kind of judging her for paying attention to them over like having kids and partners and whatever. So expectations on women is a theme and that's why I didn't love it but I can objectively see how other people and the conversations it brings up would lead them to a higher rating. At times it felt like I was reading a nonfiction. There was a lot of astrology talking here teaching me about the stars and the constellations and when you were born and how that leads to knowing exactly when you're gonna die. And she believes all of this so fully and just thinks that if everybody saw the world the way that she does, 
everything would be solved. So it's monologue after monologue to other people and to the reader about things like um, everybody, the people who are born with gifts and how people don't take full advantage of that and people are lazy and she wants to see people have more initiative and passion. And she's just a very interesting character to read from. But I honestly cannot tell you, like, I don't want this to sway me. And I also learned that uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature is like a body of work. It's more about the author than the book itself. So this stamp on it doesn't necessarily mean that this was super highly rated, but you would naturally assume because her work is beloved. But if you look at other Nobel Prize winners, their work has a whole range of ratings on Goodreads. So if I was starting at the 3.5, I'm going up a little bit for the writing that I can see other people would like. I'll go up a little bit for the fact that like clearly <laughs> it is beloved. I need to take in all of the factors. The book standing on its own and my experience with it was a three, but I think people are rating higher than me generally. So I'm gonna say a 3.7. That's my final guess. Oh, and of course, uh, Goodreads is down right now. So that's great. Okay, I got it. Oh, also I forgot to mention this is translated by Antonia Lloyd-Jones. I always mean to mention the translator when I mention the author, but I forgot. 3.9? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that does make sense. It had 87,000 ratings. So people are really reading this and enjoying it. It originally came out in 2009. I would definitely recommend it. It just didn't grab me the way that I wanted. So that means, oh, I should have said 3.8 because then that could have covered 3.7 and 3.9. But I said what I said. And now uh, we're heading out for the day and I'm ready to buy a book. Who the heck knows? I feel like honestly, I'm in the mood for a nonfiction. So I picked what I wanted. Um, it was kind of a random selection, but I got a couple things for videos I'm not gonna show you. Maybe I'll tease one of them, the housemaid. And then Rob got solo leveling book seven. I also stopped at the library because I had things on hold for me, again, video related, but then also Girlfriend on Mars that I don't know if I can actually fit in my TBR anywhere, but I do have it. So what I picked, I think I've heard the title once. I think it was recommended to me one time, but I might be mistaking it for Devil in the White City, but I was just looking in the nonfiction section. Actually, Indigo has so many nonfiction sections. I found myself in the music area and I decided to grab a Little Devil in America because it says it's in praise of black performance and I think it's my favorite thing which is like talking fiction nonfiction talking about um, media again I accidentally grabbed something I swear I didn't even see these when I grabbed it like I just do not see awards so it has um, been a national book award finalist <laughs> But hey, the last one had awards and I still got the rating wrong. I don't know how to pronounce this author's name, but I will figure it out by the next time I talk to you. Um, but this author has written a profound reflection on how black performance is inextric inextricably woven into the fabric of American culture. He, it says, is a poet, essayist, and cultural critic. That's exactly what I need. Writes prose brimming with jubilation and pain infused with the lyricism and rhythm of the musicians he loves. I only read the first um, paragraph of three in the store. It was kind of an impulse. It just like was calling to me. He explains the poignancy of performances big and small, each one feeling intensely familiar and vital, both timeless and desperately urgent. A Little Devil in America exalts the black performance that unfolds in specific moments in space and time, from mid-century Paris to the moon and back down again to a cramped living room in Columbus, Ohio. Oh my god, the boys are back so fast with smoothies. We were just watching old videos together last night and there was one filmed right here where um, I spilled a smoothie and Liam was so cute and freaking out. What the, what the say? That says booster juice. Mom broke your smoothie. The straw went through the bottom of the cup, and now there's. Well, Liam, what's on Mom's chair? That was a smoothie. Yeah, it's pretty awkward. And there's two people making our three smoothies. It's more sour than normal. What'd you get? No. My thing, that same thing I had for the last decade. Mind over matcha, swap blueberries for strawberries. That might be what spilled on the seat. Ooh, look, I got a new Invisalign. It's orange. Oh, is there blue? Cool. We did that just for fall. Right. Now we're gonna go drop off some donations. And what else? Shirts. Oh, shirts. Shirts for the wiener. 
we had a change of plans for the day. Today I was gonna read something completely different and spend the day doing something completely different because today's a holiday. Sorry for the having a puffing, I just took a big hill. Uh, today's the last holiday until Liam goes back to school. So it's our last like full day as a family together. And Rob had the day off, but he's technically on call and he got an on-call job hours away. He's basically gonna be there all day and our plans changed. We we're gonna spend the day on the beach. But instead Liam and I decided to come for our hike bike. We've never done these trails before, but it'll be fun. This is an easy trail, technically, but I have a lot of body to move around. Also, I'm wearing in Liam's um, Hydro Flask new spout. He can't open it with his braces, so I've been um, trying to wear it in. So I decided to grab the audiobook so I can do that while he gets far ahead of me. I can't even see him now. The first essay is about um, dance marathons. We'll see how long the essays are and how many I finish by the time we're done. Abdurraqib. Okay, I got 88 pages in. There's a bunch of different like essays, but there's also a lot of individual kind of essays within the essays. I don't know what to call that. For example, he will give a chapter title as 16 ways of looking at blackface. And then he will discuss a lot of instances of blackface um, from history to present day. One of them was about social media and how people will, white people will pretend to be black online. And in another author's hands, um, it would explain what that means. It would explain um, why people might do this, why it's wrong. But instead, he just gives you an example, like people are doing this. And then we'll go into a whole one about um, Rachel Dolezal. And again, doesn't give you like, this is why it's wrong. This is the insidious nature of what people are doing. He's just giving examples. And I find that a really interesting choice. Sorry, not in another author's hands, with another audience in mind. Black authors talking about racism, a lot of them are targeted at the people committing the racist acts, and it's meant to teach them something. This is not that. And so it's making my rating feel high because I think a lot of people can't appreciate uh, what this is doing. It's not over explaining anything to people who already understand these concepts. For me, I'm appreciating it because it's talking about performers who I'm familiar with, Aretha Franklin, and her entire life and death and the experience of um, celebrating her art with the world. And then it also talks about people I've never heard of, like her name was I think Ellen Armstrong? And um, she was a black magician that he says right in the pages that not a lot of people heard about. She didn't get a lot of attention, but here's what she did and here's how her legacy is important. Though I guess the intent is not within the individual essays or thoughts, there is like summaries once in a while. Um, so this whole section talks about how consumption and love are not equal parts of the same machine. To consume is not to love, and ideally love is not rooted solely in consumption. So he doesn't use any words specifically like cultural appropriation or cultural appreciation, but I think people who are confused about that, um, who see, you know, actors or whoever aligning themselves with black culture who are not black, when conversations come up about like, well, it's fine because they are, you know, appreciating it and they want to take it and use it as their own. I think he's doing a great job of summarizing, but not hammering the point home, but in a nuanced way, letting you think for yourself about how one does not equal the other. You would hope somebody consuming the media of or fashion made by or music made by a certain group of people, that that would inherently mean you do love it, respect it, and appreciate it, but that's not true, especially when th things come in earlier about um, stuff like Dave Chappelle doing certain skits where the white audience is laughing so much harder than anyone else and why they feel comfortable when he is saying things and making fun 
of his own race, while their joyous consumption of it didn't feel like love to him. Even though we've touched on so many topics, like everything is really connected. And I'm gonna, I think, switch to it physically. I don't dislike the audiobook, but I can tell that this is written by a poet. Um, there were some sections where he would say and in a really specific way that I think would have just landed better if I could figure out the cadence for myself rather than the audiobook, because it's not the author doing it. Anyway, I'll check in with you again soon. I totally forgot to tell you. Um, when I was reading Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, I so badly wanted to check Goodreads and I thought this was like an extra layer of the experiment that turned out to be really interesting because I love checking in on Goodreads when I'm loving a book or disliking a book because I want to see what other people are thinking and if other people can put into words like especially why I'm struggling through a book. So that's something I really had to fight the urge to do the other day because I obviously didn't want to see the rating and ruin it. And now the exact same thing is happening to me because not the exact same thing, the opposite thing. I want to check Goodreads and I want to see if everybody is as obsessed with the essay that I just read because this is in my top 10 favorite essays of all time. It's called um, Is It Safe to Say I Have Lost Many Games of Spades? It was like 15 pages and it was about spades, the game, if you know it, and about how there's like different iterations of the game and how that really reflects like the human experience for a lot of people. For him, how he can go into different environments or be in different cities and how he can be treated completely differently. But then also the feeling of like having something to share with your friends and how important spades is like to their community and um, his friendship group specifically. And I was just highlighting everything. And then it brought back topics that we had in previous essays about um, World War II and um, soldiers and exploitation, but then also gave us such good insight into the author and his life and how he's like the youngest of all the kids in his family and how he got gets so excited and can't like contain his excitement for things like when he got his license but then all of his siblings got it before him so it wasn't like new and exciting but it was to him and so when he gets a good hand in spades like he has a really hard time concealing it i swear it doesn't sound that special but there was just something about that that really did it for me it was so well constructed and it like hurt but it was also just so like joyous and now like i just want to know if other people in their reviews have written their favorite essays in the collection if that one hit people anyway i'm now 180 pages in so i'm gonna finish the rest in the morning good morning last day of the vlog first day of school i just dropped liam off for his first day of eighth grade oh my god we did the obligatory first day of school photos he's very much in that teenage boy phase where he doesn't want to go shopping he doesn't care about the clothes like he he wants everybody just to make the decisions for him. And while I did make him go and pick out some new hoodies, um, we went to another store and he was like, I don't want to go in. And so Rob and I went in and we made it a competition and each of us bought him a new shirt for school to see which one he would pick. And then we brought it back to the vehicle and he looked through them and he picked mine. So that's what he wore to the first day of school. And I feel uh, like a winner and now he's off. And I'm heading to breakfast with some of the hockey moms. And what else? I'm gonna finish my book today. I only have four hours till I have to pick them up. So I don't have a lot penciled in. Oh, I do wanna stop at the drugstore though, because I think I need to buy a new eyebrow pencil that's a little more red. I know, I have really big goals today. You know what I was most excited about? Is pulling out all of my like brownie tan beige whatever apparently like flesh tone practically on me clothes because um well for one i have a bunch of things in this tone that are only for fall and today i woke up and it's like 16 degrees right now well it is still going to be like 25 later right now it feels like fall and last year my hair was like the same color as my skin practically so every time i went to put on i have like three sweaters this exact same color every time i put it on i just felt like I looked like I was the same color from head to toe. Anyway, I just wanted to check in with you because the day has begun. I haven't read any more of my book, but I will. Okay, I finished my book. Claps for me. Okay. I loved it. I think that's pretty clear that I loved it. I'm giving it five stars. I think it just really summed up the idea of the necessity of art for um, joy for togetherness for survival it was also really sad 
and beautiful, which I feel like I say about a lot of my favorite books. I don't want to give you any more of my takeaways so you can still have that experience for yourself um, because I highly recommend this one if you haven't already picked it up. And now it's time to predict the rating. Now if we look at the chart, what was the chart? Oh my god, you're just staring at me. Yeah. 4.5. What? Do you even know what book I'm talking about? No. Why? Are you... Now do other people love it as much as me? I can't think of any reason why somebody wouldn't. Um, but it happens. I think nonfiction tends to lean a little bit higher. Typically, if you're already interested in what the book is going to be about, like with fiction, you don't really know what direction it's going to go. I did only put one nonfiction on my list because that's like the only book that I saw with a 4.7. So I don't think that this would be that high. Let me quickly look up some other nonfiction ratings though, because I want to be well informed. Okay, like Wild by Cheryl Strayed. I didn't love, but it has a high average rating, right? No, it has just a four. Who might be reading this? Somebody who might be reading Bad Feminist? That has a 3.9. Though that subject matter sounds more controversial than this one. Also, it's by a man. Does that typically get higher average ratings? What's that one I read recently? Black Ghost of Empire. That's what it was. Oh my gosh, I was just gonna have to scroll through my Goodreads. Okay, that one has a 4.3. Maybe between the world and me? That has a 4.4. Okay, I feel confident with this at a 4.4, going into a four, so if I say, okay, wait, so if I say a 4.5, then I'm covering 4.4, 4.5, and 4.6. 4, 4 4.62, 4.62 means I technically did not get it because it's just outside of the 4.6. <laughs> so, okay, that's great news because people love it. Um, oh, and it was in the Goodreads Awards. I did not know that. I don't think I pay very much close attention to like nonfiction memoir historical science section of the Goodreads Awards. The bad news is I predicted the wrong rating twice. This one I was more off than this one and I only got one right. So my little experiment is over. Um, I had a lot of fun reading things that I probably wouldn't have gotten to in any other capacity anytime soon. And I have a silly little vlog to post for the week. So thanks so much for hanging out. Uh, let me know if you want to see me do this again. I feel like in someone else's hands, they would make this like a little more grand of a challenge, maybe a little quicker, but I just like bringing you into my whole life and talking about books. Okay, bye.